Good morning. It's good to be with you today for morning prayer. I've been listening to Alexandra Streliski, who is a Canadian pianist who is playing a lovely tune called Burnout Fugue, which caught my attention as we are in a pandemic and the idea of burnout is very real, I think, for many people. And, and yet it's a, it's a very pleasant piece uh, to listen to and to contemplate. Well, today is Monday, uh, the 10th of August, and this day we celebrate uh, St. Lawrence, a deacon and martyr at Rome in the year 258, early, relatively early in the church's history. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. And uh, also we'll conclude, as we've been doing, uh, with a reading from Fred Rogers, uh, important things to remember. Well, our opening sentence today is from Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, We will go into the house of the Lord. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. Stop. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises. Declare to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, right, <laughs> we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the depths of the earth, and the heights of the hills is his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O come, let us adore him. The Psalms appointed for today are Psalms 99, 100, and 101. The Lord is King. Let the peoples tremble. He sits between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion and high above all peoples. They shall give thanks unto his name, which is great and wonderful. Holy is he and mighty, a king who loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed judgment and righteousness in Jacob. O oh, magnify the, lo the Lord, O oh God, our God. O oh, magnify the Lord, our God, and fall down before his footstool, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he heard them. He spoke to them out of the cloud, cloudy pillar. 
and they kept his testimonies and law he, had give, he gave them. You heard them, O Lord our God. You forgave them, O God, yet punished their evil doings. O mighty, O magnify the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. Psalm 100. O be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Be assured that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. O go your way into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures from generation to generation. Psalm 101 My song shall be of mercy and judgment. Unto you, O Lord, will I sing. O let me have understanding in the way of God godliness. When will you come to me? I will walk in my house with integrity of heart. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the sins of unfaithfulness. No such thing shall cleave to me. A crooked heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him will I destroy. Whoever has a proud look and an arrogant heart, I will not suffer him. My eyes shall look with favor upon the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. Whoever leads a godly life, he shall be my servant. No deceitful person shall dwell in my house, and the one who tells lies shall not tarry in my sight. I shall soon destroy all the ungodly who are in the land that I may root out all evildoers from the city of the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our lesson today continues with St. Paul's letter to the church in Rome, Romans chapter 10. Paul writes, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith that we proclaim, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the, scriptures, the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. 
but they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed that he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. For the voice is gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous for those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is bold to say, I have found I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held up my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our canticle today is, surely it is God who saves me. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. Therefore you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation, and on that day you shall say, Give thanks unto the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things, and this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion, ring out your joy, for the Great One in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. Come, O Holy Spirit, come. Blow in to our hearts. Blow into our minds. Blow amongst us the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and the love and compassion that God, you, O God, share for your creation, for every man, woman, and child. Amen. I'd like to reflect with you a minute or two on St. Paul's letter here, chapter 10 of the book of Romans. There are some wonderful verses that I think we should definitely hold on to. what we call refrigerator verses, those that we put on our refrigerator or on our mirror as we get dressed in the morning to remind us of who God is and the righteousness of God, the love of God, the the calling of God through Christ to us. And we're going to get to those in a second, but right now at verse 1 of chapter 10, Paul is continuing a thought, as most of these readings do, a continuation of something that's gone before. These are epistles, these are letters. And in it, he's talking about his heart's desire for the salvation of the Jews. You know, it's interesting, Paul at one point describes the Jews as his brothers, and indeed they are. He's a Jew, and he has held his credentials high. Uh, You know, a Pharisee of Pharisees, one who was well-trained in the law and, and, and versed and then called by Christ. Here in chapter 10 verse 1, he now refers to the Gentiles, uh, to us, non-Jewish, as brothers. And you see there's a bonding there uh, that occurs with Paul bridges, if you will, but he doesn't actually bridge it. Christ is the bridge. But nonetheless, you see him working as he refers to his brothers, the fellow Jews, and now his brothers and sisters in the church of Christ, the Gentiles. And so he's He's aching, he's sharing his desire that his, to his brothers in Christ, that his brothers of his ancestry, of God's chosen people, would come to call on Jesus as the Messiah. And so he talks about that, and he talks about how, and he goes back and he quotes the Old Testament in an interesting way, 
but, but the quotation is basically a reminder that God, he comes to the Jews first because they're his chosen people. This is how he chooses to reveal himself to humanity. But it was never about just salvation to the Jews or to those who keep the law of God through the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. But it's about the message of salvation to all people, Jew and Gentile. And that's what he's sort of quoting here um, as, he, as he goes to the Old Testament to, to sort of uh, challenge uh, and, and conclude in verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, look at verse 9. This is one of those quotes, one of the refrigerator quotes. If you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, there's no restriction on that. Now, of course, there's an understanding if we confess that Jesus is Lord, he is our master, he is our boss, he's the one we look to for guidance. If we look to him, if we confess him with our mouth that he's Lord and believe in our heart, which means, of course, that we follow him. It's not just knowledge. Satan the evil one has the knowledge of who Jesus is, but it's not saving knowledge because he doesn't put it into practice. And we're called to not only proclaim with our mouths, but with our hearts to confess and to believe uh, that Jesus is not only uh, Lord, but that God raised him from the dead. He is the anointed one, the Messiah. And that's what salvation is a gift of grace, if you will. And so the law is not there, again, um, in which one becomes righteous. The law is there to guide and offer direction and to give instruction. And so Paul is not really pitting the law against grace. Jesus, he says, is the end result, the fulfillment of the law. And the sad reality is that no one can trust on their behavior as their grounds of belief. So one of the things we need to look at is as Paul is addressing his Jewish brothers and then telling the, the church about how he wishes that they too would accept Christ as his, as his Gentile brothers have and sisters. Uh, he reminds us that it's not by the rituals, it's not by obedience to the law that we are saved. And so we in the church have a very strong message to learn from this because we've been around now for 2,000 years and we've been blessed uh, with a great voice and uh, uh, an immense power, uh, in, uh, particularly in the West. A and so there is a danger of us feeling self-righteous. We're God's chosen people now and I've been baptized, I've been confirmed, I own more than one Bible. There's a danger in holding up all the things that we've done and saying this is what makes me righteous, because it's not. What makes us righteous is God's grace that, again, if we confess with our lips and we believe in our hearts and we follow Jesus as the Messiah, then salvation is open to everyone. It's open to Jew and Gentile. And so when he concludes the reading today with verse 21, but of Israel, he says, all day long I've held up my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Referring particularly, this is a quotation, uh, to the Jewish people. We need to be careful as Christians. Are, are we disobedient? Are we contrary? And I dare say the challenge is very real for all of us to rely and trust in God's grace and not own what we think we've done him a favor. Uh, one of the things that I find very disturbing is, of course, to listen to the news about the uh, rioting uh, and destruction of property in Chicago and immediately to see our country polarize on political things uh, and, and how someone will spin that one way or the other, almost to be saying they deserve what they got. And yet to watch the mayor of Chicago today um, 
praise the uh, police department for doing their job, uh, the police department talking about how, look, this is, this is not... Um, uh, this is not a righteous indignation of a wrong. These are people seizing an opportunity to steal, to break, to create chaos. And so in some ways, it's not political. Uh, it's simply uh, our society falling apart, shredding, it would seem, at the seams, uh, where people who are anarchists will use anything uh, to, uh, to, as an excuse uh, and, and how we, as Christians, have a higher calling not to just spin it politically, but to actually pray and to become involved and say, what can I do in my community that will make it a better place? What, what nurturing can I offer as opposed to condemnation and self-righteousness? And that's a challenge. And we'll get to that in a moment. But for St. Paul today, uh, what strong a message he has, um, and how beautiful are the feet to preach good news. Um, and then a call for us, and, and, and we use this sometimes uh, as, as an invitation, this, this particular sentence, or sentences, as an invitation for, um, oh goodness, for the collection, uh, for the offertory. Uh, but it's so much richer than that when Paul asks a series of questions about... Um, well, look, look, at, look at verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? You know, sometimes when we take that up as a collection offering, it sounds like we're making a collection of missionaries. And of course, in some ways we are. But we need to realize this is not a collection of funds to support just missionaries. The sending goes to everyone, to all Christians, at the conclusion of the liturgy. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We're the ones who are to preach the good news. Certainly there's a place for missionaries and we support missionaries, but we need to understand that each individual Christian, you and I, and, and there's no collar being worn here. We, anyone who would be so bold to say, I am a follower of Christ, I am a Christian, we are missionaries. We're the ones sent. We're the ones that get the compliment, how beautiful are the feet who, of those who preach the good news. We're to have beautiful feet because all of us are to be sharers of the gospel. And so... That's what breaks my heart is when we as Christians can quickly move into sort of self-righteousness and condemnation and, and, and polarize over politics and, and even nationalism when the call of Christianity is so deep and rich, it's universal, it's larger than this world. And, and so let us seek the compassion and love of God and let us seek to nurture this world with the good news of Christ. And sort of as a foundational statement, let's now say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. The collect for today comes from this past Sunday, yesterday. This is in year A, proper 14. Almighty God, give us the increase of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you have promised. Make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I mentioned at the beginning of our worship today that we celebrate the feast of St. Lawrence, a deacon and martyr in Rome, the year 258. This is the colic associated with um, St. Lawrence. Almighty God, you gave your servant Lawrence boldness to confess the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, before the rulers of this world and courage to die for this faith. Grant that we may always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us and to gladly suffer for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A little background on uh, St. Lawrence. He was a, a deacon, and um, one of the things that um, happened is uh, there was an authority, a, a pagan, uh, who wanted the riches of the church. Um, and Lawrence, and as well as others, we have St. John Chrysostom doing this at a different time and occasion, have sold chalices and precious items that the church has collected to, um, to hold the body and blood of Christ and the like uh, to provide for the needs of the poor. Uh, the church is not a museum. Uh, we're not in the collection business, so to speak, for the sake of that. Um, and so what happened is uh, Lawrence gave to the poor uh, the money of the church and he even sold some of the expensive vessels and so forth so he'd have more money to give away to take care of the, the church. And so the prefect of Rome, which is a greedy man, uh, had this idea that there was just tremendous wealth from the church and he ordered Lawrence to bring the church's treasures to him. And he gave Lawrence three days to do so. And so what Lawrence did is he went through the city of Rome and he gathered the poor, uh, he gathered the sick people uh, that he cared for, and he brought them, he asked them to come with him to the prefect's um, place of authority, and he said this, as re he pointed to the people, this is the church's treasure, as he refers to the people. And I, I think we can draw a huge lesson from St. Lawrence being so clear uh, we have buildings, we have things that have been entrusted to us over time, uh, and we don't discard them or treat them lightly. But the treasure of the church is not the buildings, it's not art, it's not silver, it's not gold. The treasure of the church are the people who make up the church. Souls and bodies, Christians are the treasures. And so what happened to Lawrence is he was condemned to death and to be tortured. And so as the story goes, uh, he was, um, the idea was, okay, you're a smart aleck, so we're going to really make you suffer. Uh, and so St. Lawrence was grilled. He was tied and placed on a grill on top, uh, um, above a slow-burning charcoal fire. And this is one of those stories that I, I hope is true because it shows First of all, never lose your sense of humor. Know that God is greater than our immediate sufferings. And so Lawrence, in the middle of this torture, says, turn me over. I'm done on this side. And before he died, 
he's reported to have said, it's cooked enough now, and then he died. Uh, he mocked the instrument of his execution. He showed that there's something greater than that. And we've seen that played out in contemporary fiction, but this is true. I believe it's true. Uh, that, that Lawrence maintained a, a sort of sense of humor knowing that no matter what suffering he was going through, uh, God's grace was bigger, his reward was greater, and um, what can the powers of this world do to me? They can put us to death, but they can't even take St. Lawrence's humor. Well, that's a little bit background on St. Lawrence, whom we uh, commemorate today. So it's not just that he gave his life, and certainly he did, uh, but he actually demonstrated the treasures of the church being the people, and he even said, uh, sort of mockingly, uh, I'm cooked on this side, I'm done, turn me over. The collect for today is for the renewal of life, Monday. O oh God, the King Eternal, who divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet into the way of justice and in the way of peace. Uh, having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when the night comes, rejoice to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the prayer for mission, the mission of the church. And you, I meant to mention it in, in my homily. Um, we also had that wonderful quote that, that there's neither Jew nor Gentile, that, that, that God uh, his offer of salvation is for everyone. There's no discrimination, male, female. The church is hugely uh, democratic. And if you think about it, the law is too. Uh, there is no special group of people who have the law. It's given by God uh, to be on the hearts of all people, the Jews first and then us. So the collect for mission, our mission. Oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite your prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. Lord, we continue to lift up the people of Beirut for the devastation that has occurred there. Catastrophic damage and loss of life. We pray for our nation. We pray on two levels that we as individuals, as citizens of our great nation, and that we as Christians would always seek something better than of ourselves, that we would practice a civic duty and responsibility that acknowledges um, the need and the, and the call for all of us to, to look after one another. Uh, we pray against uh, senseless violence and anarchy, and we pray that we would all work for true fairness, righteousness, and justice and that we would not be hijacked by one or the other. And we pray as Christians who are called to practice agape, self-sacrificial love. And that calling is so high, for it calls us to look beyond ourselves, but to look to Christ truly as our Lord and Savior, and to look through His eyes with compassion on everyone, no matter what language, no matter what race, no matter what education, no matter of anything. We're reminded of Paul's writing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And let us not be a hindrance to that. In fact, I pray, Lord, that you would anoint us as preachers and bearers of the good news. 
wherever we may be. We pray for those who suffer. We pray especially for our good law enforcement personnel and those in the military and those who are seeking to do and to serve. As the old motto said, to protect and to serve. And that's honorable. It's virtuous. And we pray for those who seek a better society, for that too is honorable and virtuous. Let us not be drawn, O Lord, into the abyss, but to remember who we are, saved and sanctified through Christ and Christ alone. Please join with me in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. We pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And now the prayer of St. John Chrysostom. Chrysostom means golden tongue. He was a wonderful preacher of the Eastern Church in Constantinople. And he also is known for selling the riches of the church to provide for the hungry, uh, the needs of the people, the treasures of the church. And so uh, I ask you to treasure this prayer by the golden tongue, not on his own merits and rhetoric, but because he proclaimed the golden riches of Jesus Christ with eloquence. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. You have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, our Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to share some words now from important things to remember from Fred Rogers. And I, I'm going to re read it twice because it's, it's a, we have to contemplate what he's saying here. Uh, Fred Rogers was an optimistic person, a Christian with optimism. And you see that here. There's an unknown, uh, excuse me, an unstated truth here also about what happens when someone is not nurtured. But that's not what he's talking about. He's referring to a person who is nurtured. There's a nurturing element to all human beings whenever they themselves have been nurtured. And it's going to be expressed one way or another. The word nurture is very important. It comes all the way through Latin and then through Old French into the English language. It originally meant basically to feed someone, uh, where we get our word nutrition, if you will, um, to care for and encourage the growth or development of someone, um, to feed, to cherish, to offer nourishment and to um, supply them with encouragement and development. And that's where I think we as Christians and actually morning prayer or any time we're together and reading the scripture is nourishment for us. And so let me read this again, reflecting on the word nourishment, to feed on God's word, to encourage one another, to be encouraged and to be an encourager to be a one who nurtures. There's a nurturing element to all human beings whenever, whenever they themselves are nurtured. 
is going to be expressed one way or another. That's where we make a difference. If you and I will take today, for instance, as an opportunity to nurture someone, to encourage someone, that's a whole different kettle of fish than a person who's a critic, uh, who uh, is um, self-righteous, uh, one who is judgmental, but a person who says, today, I'm going to be an encourager. Not focus on the glass half empty, but to focus on the potential through Christ that everyone can have. And so my challenge for you and for me is to be an encourager today and always because we have the great message of hope and truth through Jesus Christ. I wish you all a wonderful day and God willing, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.